Wasn't it a strange way down? After a year of astonishing health gains, I thought I'd actually begun to find my feet. Instead, I had the rug pulled out from under them and fell with a resounding thud into an abyss of emotional agony unlike anything I'd ever experienced before. My usual effervescence became as still as flat soda left open after a party. I, who was chatty, usually became silent. My inveterate curiosity um, in the world turned dull and morose. Where in the hell had I gone? I'd never had to battle clinical depression before as my problems manifested physically, not emotionally. My only depressions had been brief, those of loss and grief, which is temporary, shifting to anger, sorrow, and ultimately acceptance. This was unlike anything I'd ever experienced or even heard before. It was as though everything that made me me had been ripped away, condemned to wander the underworld in the dark alone, and all that was left was a thin gray ghost. She kept the body hydrated, fed, and exercised, but my sense of humor, passions, gifts were gone as though I never possessed them. My soul self separated from my body, leaving behind only a dead zombie, a faded remnant of my former self. All joy, all pleasure fled with them. Like living in Hades, where even your favorite foods taste of ashes and metallic water. In one of the over 50 benzo withdrawal groups I discovered years later, I found depersonalization and derealization were quite common benzo withdrawal symptoms. But at the time, I had no idea you could have such a nightmarish setback so long after quitting the drugs. I tried all my considerable coping skills, but in a year, the DPDR and anhedonia hadn't budged one iota. Then I made a major error. I knew by now that benzos were harmful and addictive, though not quite how dangerous, but I still thought antidepressants were safe. I decided to take them for just a little while, just to jumpstart my brain, as a naturopath had put it, then safely quit. Remeron jumpstart my brain, all right. They shot me out of a cannon over the rainbow into benzo wars. <laughs> It's a very nice place. Who said that? <laughs> 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 huh? Pleasant down that way, too. That's funny. Wasn't he pointing the other way? Of course, people do go both ways. I was unable to write for nearly 20 years that I was prescribed benzos and a tricyclic antidepressant, not for depression, but for the pain and insomnia of fibro. Doctors said, it's a cognitive impairment caused by a severe worsening of fibromyalgia. I'd written for a living as a freelance writer. Now I could barely write a decent paragraph. Some days I couldn't think at all, the brain fog dense and thick as chocolate. It, it felt as though part of my brain had taken a direct hit and in the wiring where my writer's brain had went perched pretty firmly like a gaping hole. My mind would drive down what used to be a superhighway with a tunnel, but when I got there, the tunnel was blocked with con concrete. After a decade, I gave up on the idea of ever putting pen to paper or fingers to keyboard again. But after I got off the medication, all five of them, I heard the voice of the goddess Aphrodite telling me I'd write again. I didn't believe her after 20 years, but six months off all the drugs, and having discovered my triclosan allergy, huge changes in my mental processes began to emerge. Once I banished all toxins from my home and took curcumin for six months, not only did cheek and ankle bones reemerge, but so did a lucid brain. I began to have the urge to write again. Ideas and inspiration began to trickle from the part of my brain I thought permanently destroyed, and the gaping hole seemed to mend and then heal. So I volunteered for Gordon Neighborhood House's community newsletter. As a writer, I felt rusty as the tin man in a rainstorm, but they loved the articles, called me the bomb. As mind and skills began to improve, I decided to start a blog. I was exploring the lead character one day, an alter ego who sprang full blown from my newly reborn writer's subconscious like Athena. I created the name Miss Loca Voracious, for like the character, I am fresh, wild, and local, and thoroughly voracious about everything I eat or, and drink after being able to digest only four to six foods for a decade. 
She was literate, witty, old fashioned, yet strangely more contemporary than the moderns. I told a friend, she's like a cross between Drain Jane Austen dragged kicking and screaming into the computer era and a drag queen. Yeah, I repeated, she's like a drag queen over the top and larger than life. The next day I was having a, a quiet late lion in bed and musing about the blog to be when I heard a melodious yet masculine voice say in my ear, I'm not like a drag queen, dickhead. I am a drag queen. <laughs> I screamed in my head. Now I'm as open-minded as the next person, more so perhaps being a feminist pagan who's heard the voices of her beloved dead from time to time for nearly 30 years. And I was familiar with the concept proposed by Swiss psychoanalyst Carl Jung that every man has an inner woman, the anima, and every woman an inner man, the animus. But it's one thing to enjoy the idea as an intellectual construct and quite another to have a loud gay guy in your head insulting you. At one point, I did panic, thinking I'd gone well and truly bonkers, past the boundaries of the delightfully batshit crazy I already enjoyed. We chatted for a while and I found him warm and funny, but I still asked him to go away for three weeks. He agreed. After all, I'd lived alone with only my own inner voice for company for over 30 years, since my sole effort at cohabitation with a brilliant alcoholic musician led to my fleeing the frozen wilds of Edmonton back to warm, wet Vancouver, deliriously happy to be alone once more, no longer dealing with the endless drama of addiction. So after three weeks of at first blessed silence, I missed the male voice in my head and invited him back. He returned, advising, supporting, and making me laugh so hard I'd have brothel mouthed if we hadn't been in bed. Ms. L, or RJ as we later named him together, was witty as hell, but also supportive, creative, and kind, and he amused the bejesus out of me. Kind of like the big brother I always wanted, but my parents were just too thoughtless to provide. Insomnia became a joy with my new brother of the soul, my inner guide. So Linda and RJ, whose drag name was Dizzy Ms. Lizzie, became quite literally inseparable for a time. Now, my experience with hallucinations was different than almost anyone's I read about. Many North Americans hear voices telling them to kill themselves or even cut off people's heads and eat them. Ew, I'm vegan. Are the people at least pasture raised? No chemicals, no steroids? My hallucination was a fashion maven. He said, darling, you're starting your career over again at your slightly advanced age. And quite frankly, you're just the teensiest bit dowdy. Let me choose your clothes. I promise I'll make you fabulous. Then people will compliment you extravagantly, be curious, and you can tell them about the blog and the comedy. It'll be great PR. Then he'd look in my closet and whoosh, 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 in seconds pick clothes and wild combinations I'd never have combined in a million years, mixing vintage with contemporary. I wore one of his outfits and went out very tentatively and got the very best compliments of my life. You look like your outfit was designed by Vivian Westwood, said somebody. Another mentioned Jean-Paul Gaultier. When I told someone about my fashion inner drag queen, he squealed, oh my God, you're channeling Erte. Straight normal people asked me if they could rent him. I replied, I don't know how I acquired him. I posted pics on Facebook and on the blog. A gay friend told me he had three friends who loved my look so much they wanted to dress like me for Halloween. Ms. L had accomplished his goal. I was wild, over the top, and appeared dressed by a couturier designer. He tried to tutor me in irresistibility, and I learned to flirt with old, young, men, women, gay and straight. And as a friend later said, rocks, trees, and water. RJ would flirt with cute veggies, saying, hey, gorgeous lettuce, you want to come home with me? I swear it perked up its little green fronds. Now he seemed a whole lot better than the average ranting, raving hallucinations with demons I'd read about, and I wondered why. Perhaps due to excellent therapy plus intense dream and nightmare work, my experience with chemical psychosis was more like a cross between a trip to Oz and an ayahuasca shamanic journey with occasional bouts of a bad acid trip thrown in. When batshit crazy, I sought counseling, joined an AA group to stay off my addiction, fed street kids, and threw some great parties. In some ways during this period, I became the person I was always meant to be, combining all of my former selves, writer, storyteller, activist. 
In others, I was loonier than a fruit bat. Perhaps it was my age or experience, but one foot was always firmly on the ground, but the other was in la-la land along with my brain. But I recognized the breaks with reality and enjoyed them. I used to say, I thought when I quit my addiction, I'd become boringly normal. Instead, I lost my mind. Oh, if you see her, tell her I hope she's enjoying herself half as much as I am. As far as I'm concerned, reality needs to be broken up with from time to time, or it gets conceited thinking it's the only one. Charles Bukowski once wrote, some people never go crazy. What truly horrible lives they must lead. I agreed. The strange magic of benzo ox had begun.